All right, our, our third uh, speaker today is uh, Professor Jonathan Schaffer from Rutgers University. Uh, specializes in metaphysics, but also works in uh, epistemology, language, mind, philosophy of science. And his talk today uh, is titled Ontology in the Image of Explanation. If oh, that, it was. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Hazan. Thanks uh, for all coming up today. Um, I um, decided I've been working on a paper on quantifier variants. Uh, uh, just uh, something a little different from the grounding stuff that I usually work on and was going to talk about. So I decided to switch to that today. So we're going to do heavy ontology, light ideology. Um, and the kind of background for this is, well, there's this um, view that I like about the first order ontological debates, which I'll call heavy ontology, which is that these are serious substantive debates. And um, there's a real issue about whether the world contains, say, um, uh, 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 just maybe just particles, or maybe living organisms, or maybe uh, composite artifacts, or other composite objects. So I, so I want to endorse that as a, a serious debate worth having. But then there's this other issue that has gotten tied into heavy ontology in the recent literature about whether we want to be very serious about our ideological choices, about the terms that we use. So I want to endorse a very lightweight kind of pragmatic attitude towards questions about, for instance, should we prefer to theorize using the package of logical connectives of conjunction and negation, or should we prefer to theorize using disjunction and negation, or maybe just the Sheffer stroke? I don't think the world cares which logical connectives we use when we're theorizing. So that's, the, uh, th that's roughly what light ideology is about. And what I'm primarily concerned to make the case for is that the combination of views of heavy ontology and light ideology is stable. And what we're going to see in the existing literature coming out of the uh, uh, debate between Eli Hirsch and Ted Sider is uh, a kind of prevailing attitude that the combination of heavy ontology and light ideology is unstable, that the only way to prop up heavy ontology is through heavy ideology, in particular, preference for certain kinds of quantifier means. So that's what I'm going to be op uh, opposing today. And I'm going to try to, I'm not going to defend heavy ontology, that's uh, uh, for other work. Uh, and I'm not going to try to defend uh, light ideology either. I mean, really, I don't have much more than an incredulous stare for those who think the world might prefer us to work with conjunction and negation over disjunction and negation. But again, that's not, that's not what I'm arguing for today. I'm just arguing for the stability of combining heavy ontology and light ideology. Moreover, I'm not, gonna, I'm not claiming that my way is the only way of stably combining heavy ontology and light ideology. Light ideology. I'm just saying that it is a way. Um, and before proceeding, I do want to just flag two semantic assumptions that are going to play a big role in what's to come. Uh, the first is just a, a very orthodox treatment of the semantics of quantification, on which, roughly speaking, for instance, the existential quantifier, when we say, you know, uh, uh, EXFX, we're saying that something in the domain uh, uh, falls under the predicate F. It's very, very orthodox semantics of quantification, and also a very orthodox treatment, uh, sort of background semantic framework of model theoretic semantics on which the quantifier draws on the domain, but the domain is not itself an element of the object language. It's a posit, uh, uh, posited by the interpreter who's modeling the object language in the meta language. Okay. So what you should really understand me as defending is the idea that heavy ontology and light ideology can be stably combined given these very orthodox background semantic assumptions. I guess since I'm arguing for a stability claim, I'm entitled to just make my own assumptions. But it matters to me that these are completely orthodox. So um, in section one, I'll talk about uh, quantifier variance and the concern that heavy ontology and light ideology might not be able to be stably combined. And in section two, I will talk about why I think this uh, whole debate involves, I think, real confusions about quantification. And I'll try to explain how you can get stability. And I should preface this by saying, like, you know, I'm going to be saying that excellent philosophers like Hilary Putnam, Eli Hirsch, and Ted Sider are deeply confused about quantification. So probably I'm the one who's confused. <laughs> but if so, I'd just like to know how. So on we go. So uh, heavy ontology makes quantifier variants. So we start with the muriology debate spurred by people like Peter von Inwagen. Uh, 
we ask this familiar crowd for many of you, how many things are in the box? Let's just pretend those circles are mere logical symbols with no proper parts. And we see the, the nihilist says uh, three things are in the box, counting all the symbols. The universalist says seven things are in the box. She counts all the, all, all the composites. There's other answers to consider, but we'll just focus on, on those two. So we seem to have this interesting, important, first-order metaphysical debate as to how many things are in the box. Heavy ontology is the view in general, and it's really a broad cluster of views, so I'm only going to try to characterize it in, in vague terms. It's the idea that that's a debate in good stead. There's a, there's a serious substantive issue uh, that's uh, for the world to decide as to how many things are in the box. The world hosts some collection of objects, and there's just a question of whether it's got three or seven or maybe some intermediate uh, whereas light ontology, again, this is a cluster of views, so I'm not going to try to characterize it very precisely, but it represents the attitude that there was something defective in that first order metaphysical debate. Something went wrong. The reason why I'm not that concerned here to give a precise characterization of these views, just because I don't think you can, this is really a cluster of views, is what I, I'm specifically interested in is a kind of tradition within light ontology of the quantifier variance tradition uh, that's a kind of thread that we can see tracing through uh, Carnap, Putnam, and Hirsch. Um, oh, I mean, uh, I think actually, uh, 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 as Amy and other people have discussed, I don't think Carnap himself is a quantifier of variantist, but he's drawn on in this tradition. Uh, this is a tradition of thinking that what went wrong with this debate is there's some kind of confusion over language. And it's really with Putnam and Hirsch that we get the more targeted idea that this debate is really some kind of confusion over quantification. And Putnam, in particular, introduces this idea that there are distinct quantifier meanings. I'm flagging this because I think this is a confusion. But that there are these distinct quantifier meanings, and that um, each of which is consistent with the uh, logical rules of quantification. I guess that's a sort of minimum requirement on, for instance, being the existential quantifier, that you support the existential introduction and existential elimination rules. But he says, consistent with these rules, there are these uh, uh, multiple uses, multiple meanings of, the, of, of, of quantification. Um, and it's kind of just uh, up to us just to decide which quantifier meaning we wish to adopt. So we could adopt the universalist quantifier meaning, and should we do so, and go on to speak a language in which the existential quantifier has a universalist meaning, then it's true to say, in that language, there are seven things in the box. False to say, in that language, there are three things, just three things in the box. Or we could adopt the, uh, the nihilist meaning of the existential quantifier, and should we do so, then it'll be true in that different language that there are three things in the box. False that there are seven things. So we can decide, we can decide to say either. We can choose, just freely choose which quantifier meaning uh, we want to adopt. Uh, what Hirsch adds is a kind of more realist perspective on this. He says, hey, look, you know, if we actually ask the question in English or some other natural language, there is, in fact, a meaning to the quantifier. And that'll just dictate. Uh, Hirsch himself would say that it's probably neither three nor seven. He thinks that the English meaning of uh, uh, exists is some kind of restricted, uh, 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 gives you some kind of restricted composition. Uh, but the point there is that it's really uh, not a deep question about what objects the world uh, 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 hosts. It's more of a kind of shallow verbal or linguistic question as to which meaning we choose to adopt. So uh, in that sense, Hirsch is, kind of, is on the light ontology side a deflator of these kinds of things. So that's heavy ontology versus light ontology. Um, and so this has been thought uh, uh, by many uh, to be a serious threat to uh, heavy ontology and to those of us who are interested in pursuing these first order metaphysical debates. And so uh, uh, Ted Sider in particular has uh, taken quantifier variance to be a, a serious challenge and has mounted a, an intricate defense against quantifier variance that involves heavy ideology. So Sider begins with this perspective that uh, uh, you know, metaphysics is not just about our own 
anthropology, but it's also about um, which, uh, which ideology we think, to use his phrase, carves at the joints. Whether causal predicates, quantifiers, or names, and modal operators carve at the joints. And carve at the joints is supposed to indicate a kind of worldly preference for certain kinds of terms. So Sider comes to the view that the world uh, is uh, uh, very opinionated about uh, which terms we use to write the book of the world, and that there is um, a fact of the matter and a real debate to be had as to appropriate choices of ideology. And he takes himself to be uh, drawn on the Lewisian idea uh, that we have, we, we have naturalness for predicates and extending this idea of naturalness beyond the predicate to, other, to arbitrary other expressions in the language, including uh, 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 logical connectives, quantifiers, and the like. I actually think this is a misreading of Lewis. I don't think Lewis is, uh, has naturalness for uh, predicates in the first instance. I talk about this in the written version of the paper. I won't really have a chance to get into this here. What Lewis has in the first instance is naturalness for properties, or better, naturalness for certain extensions. And then predicates, when we come to interpret them, they get magnetized towards the natural properties. It's the naturalness of the properties and not of the predicates that do the work. Um, um, so Sider says, and uh, there's a, um, I'll, I'll, I'll read this quote just because it uses the phrase, the central question of meta-ontology. So that, that, that will convince you that what I'm doing is very important. <laughs> So he says, uh, Sider says, quantifier variance remains the crux. The central question of meta-ontology is that of whether there are many equally good quantifier meanings. And there's this phrase, quantifier meanings again. Or whether there is a single best quantifier meaning. It is a question about nature's joints. It is a question of how much quantificational structure the world can so we have this idea of the world as privileging certain bits of ideology in particular, and we have this, again, this idea that goes back really to Putnam, of there being this wide variety of quantifier meanings that's threatening the project of heavy ontology, and this idea that heavy ontology can be saved if we can say that the world wants us to use a particular quantifier meaning. So, okay. so, oh, I should have characterized a little bit more, I guess I did at the beginning, of just what I mean in uh, adopting the light ideology perspective is to say that the world, uh, uh, the world doesn't care which, uh, uh, which terms we use. Uh, there might be pragmatic reasons why we would, why it would be more useful for us to theorize in certain terms than in others. I think it's probably more natural for minds like ours to use, say, the conjunction and negation package over the Sheffer stroke. The Sheffer stroke is kind of psychologically unnatural for us, I think. But if an, you know, if, 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 if an alien intelligence, if the Martians landed and they just, it just went smoother for them to work with the Sheffer stroke and they're like, oh, conjunction and negation. Oh yeah, we can understand those by like reverse defining them out of the Sheffer stroke as one can do. They wouldn't be making any mistake. They wouldn't be getting the world wrong. They would just have a little bit of a different, uh, 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 start psychologically more natural starting point. So uh, here's the thesis that I'm going to defend. Uh, I'm, this is what I'm calling stable. The combination that heavy ontology plus light ideology is stable. So. Again, if you came in wanting to think there was a serious debate over, say, Mariology, but not really a serious debate over uh, conjunction and negation versus disjunction and negation, you should hope that stable can be sustained. So I'll be championing that view. As I said, I won't be arguing for uh, the component positions of heavy ontology or light ideology here. Um, but what we see in the hirsch sider debate is the idea that, that state is the claim that stable is indefensible. Hirsch says that heavy ontology falls to quantifier variants, so he doesn't think heavy ontology can be sustained no matter what. Sider replies that heavy ontology can be propped up by heavy ideology. So both agree that you can't have both. And here's a little map of the domain here. Uh, 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 graduate students in the audience, there's an unoccupied box. <laughs> uh, dissertations are there to be written. Um, so there, there's Hirsch, there's Sider. 
I, I put myself in the heavy ontology light ideology box. I'm sure I'm not alone in there. I think that probably most metaphysicians would also want to uh, co-locate with me in, 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 in that box, um, but uh, I'm not. I'll just put myself there and I'll allow, I'll allow any further uh, 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 philosophers who wish to join me to, to let it be known that they're in the box. Okay. So that's, that's, that's the terrain. It's the thesis that uh, debates such as the mirrorological debate are serious debates such that um, uh, they're, they're, the world prefers one view over another. It's the thesis that the world does not prefer any, there's no worldly uh, distinction, uh, there's no uh, distinguished worldly joints for ideology. Um, so I'm trying to be quick so we have some time for Q&A. Um, that's the first section set up. The second section will go a little longer where I try to show how you can defend heavy ontology without putting really any pressure on ideology at all. So let me start with a claim about uh, quantifiers. Um, this is a claim that uh, the semantic action of quantified expressions comes through two sources. There's the clause uh, associating a quantified expression with a semantic value. And then there's a domain uh, over which the, uh, a, a given quantifier ranges. And my, uh, one of my key claims, which sources up here, is that any quantifier variance must involve either variance in the semantic clause associating the expression with a semantic value or variance in the domain over which a quantifier ranges. To put this another way, fix the clause and fix the domain and um, the semantic action of quantifiers is completely fixed. There can be no uh, remaining variation in quantifier means. So um, let me give a rough illustration of that, and then I'll try to make that precise by seeing some formal developments of quantification in, uh, in Tarski's framework and in the more modern conception of generalized quantifiers. So uh, rough illustration, think of a, we've got the existential quantifier closing a formula. So we, have, we start off with, some, like, that's what, with the open formula fx, and we close it with the existential quantifier, so we've got ex fx. The, resulting, uh, the result is true if and only if something in the domain is an f. Something in the domain satisfies the formula. So uh, if you fix what's in the domain, we also have to fix, of course, the interpretation of f. That's a, a separate matter about the interpretation of predicates. Um, if you fix what's in the domain, and you fix that E, uh, that the expression E denotes the existential quantifier, then um, it's just fixed whether EX, FX is going to hold or not. That's the key claim uh, of sources. Um, to see this uh, work through more precisely, uh, we can start with a kind of uh, a Tarskian approach where we have a recursive definition of uh, when an assignment satisfies a formula uh, that includes uh, the clause for when an existentially, uh, uh, for, for when an assignment uh, satisfies an existentially quantified formula that goes like this. Assignment alpha satisfies the existentially quantified formula EX phi, if and only if. There's an assignment beta that's an X variant of alpha, uh, meaning it's, um, holds fixed what, uh, 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 what objects the other variables get assigned to, but can change what x gets assigned to, uh, such that beta satisfies phi. So to see how this supports sources, uh, let's just uh, suppose that we've got three things in our domain, a, b, and c, and let's say that it, uh, uh, it's fixed, uh, that uh, 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 we've got some predicate f, and it's fixed that uh, FA, uh, but not FB or FC. And we want to know whether EX, FX is satisfied by a given assignment A. Well, there'll be some um, X variant of alpha, beta, that maps X onto A. And remember that we just, uh, just told you at the start that, that uh, A falls under the predicate F. So um, 
beta will satisfy um, uh, uh, fx. So that, so what I've told you is that if we fix the domain at a, b, and c, and we have to fix what falls under the predicate f, um, and we fix that that ex is associated with this uh, uh, semantic clause, then we've just fixed. I've just given you an illustration that I should hope convinces you that uh, that just fixes whether ex phi is. Um, we can see the same uh, claim of sources coming up from uh, the uh, uh, more modern perspective of generalized quantifiers, um, where here we uh, move beyond the Tarskian approach in several respects. First, um, this is important for what's to come later, our semantic values are taken with respect to a model, which is a domain interpretation pair. So you see that little subscript M after the, um, the double brackets for sem the semantic value operator. That means takes the semantic value in the model M. Um, so um, what, uh, we also deal not just with the, the, two bin the two quantifiers, sum and all, that Tarski treats, but with the full range of natural language quantifiers, including most, many, between 3 and 17, all of these can be uh, treated in a uniform manner in a generalized quantifier framework. And the third thing that happens in the general quantifier framework is that all uh, quantifiers express comparisons between properties. So we always have a restrictor slot, that's, that's R up there, and a scopal slot S, both of which take properties. Uh, the R slot can be occupied by uh, vacuous properties such as being self-identical. It doesn't have to be a substantive restrictor, but there's always a slot for a potentially uh, 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 contentful restrictor. So uh, the general template for quantification uh, is that of comparing properties. So um, QRS is true if and only if Q many members of R are members of S are members of S. Um, and the way this plays out for the existential quantifier, well, we get a kind of homophonic clause. Um, it, uh, um, the, the property of um, uh, being an RS pair, such that sum uh, R is an S. We don't get these kind of reductive clauses uh, in, in semantics generally. But the way that you can understand this set theoretically, the comparison is that of there being a non-empty intersection between the R and the S cells. So, what, so if we say, say stum, some student smiles in a generalized quantifier framework, um, we're looking at the scopal property of, 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 of the smilers and restricted to students. And we're asking whether the intersection of the smilers and the students is non-empty. We're asking whether some thing that's in the student box is also in the smiler box. And to see how this upholds sources, um, we can just see that, well, given our interpretation that's mapping, that's delivering a set for students and a set for smilers, uh, there's just a question of whether there is an element that's in both sets, whether the intersection is non-empty or not. So given that the meaning of the existential quantifier is this thin logical meaning, sorry, uh, given that the, cl the clause associated with the existential quantifier, the clause that maps the expression to a semantic value, just gives it the thin logical requirement that the sets being compared have a non-empty intersection. Um, and then given the uh, uh, domain and the interpretation of predicates that assigns um, uh, 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 sets to the predicates, we just have a logical question of whether the sets have a non-empty intersection or not. There's no further room for variation given that we've fixed the input sets and given that we've fixed the requirement of non-empty intersection. So this was just a bunch of ways of trying to get you to see that all the semantic action of quantifiers comes through the clause that associates the, uh, a, a given expression, a given uh, uh, a syntactic string with a semantic value and the domain. So now that I've hopefully convinced you that there's two uh, uh, components to the semantic action of quantifiers. 
I'm now going to try to argue that the clause stuff is totally, uh, is totally irrelevant to concerns about quantifier variance, that it's the domain that's where the real action is. So, uh, why clausal variance is not relevant to quantifier variance. Really, if you think about what the clause does, as I've been trying to emphasize, the clause maps uh, an uninterpreted syntactic string to a semantic value. So, I mean, it's uncontroversial that the uninterpreted syntactic string sum could get mapped to anything you like. You could give it, you could map it to snow or to guacamole or to mint or to, 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 different, to a different quantifier like many. Uh, that's, an, that's an uncontroversial thing. Uh, nothing, no heavy ontologist would deny that uh, a, a given syntactic string could be mapped onto different semantic values. That's not what the issue is. Uh, and to see in uh, deeper ways that that's not an issue, keep in mind that one of the guiding constraints on this idea that there can be different quantifier meanings is that they're supposed to at least preserve the logic of the existential, uh, of, of the quantifier issue. So if we're looking at different meanings for the existential quantifier, they're supposed to at least preserve existential introduction and existential elimination. Um, but, if we, but if the semantic value, if we've got something that's supposed to be an existential quantifier, and you give it a semantic value that isn't that of non-empty intersection of the property sets being compared, you will not uphold the introduction or the elimination rules. So if you require that, um, uh, if you require anything less than uh, non-empty intersection, if you allow the existential, if you allow an existentially quantified claim to hold when there is an empty intersection, then you won't be able to eliminate the existential quantifier because whatever you write, there, there might be. Then you're allowing that there might be nothing that's in cases where there uh, it will be nothing in say both the, uh, that's in both the students and the smilers boxes. So you can't go from uh, there exists a, a smiling student to, uh, 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 you know, for, to, for, for some um, uh, 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 unused name, you know, uh, let Anne be a smiling student. Um, and if you require more, if you require more than non-empty intersection, then you can't go from Anne as a smiling student to there exists a smiling student. Because all Anne as a smiling student tells you is that you've got someone namely Anne in both boxes. But if more is required, you can't generalize. Um, moreover, if we, if we think about clausal variation and we map some to some other semantic value, I mean, that's fine, we can do that. Um, what we're really done is we've changed, um, we haven't given a difference in quantifier meanings, we've just mapped a syntactic string to a different quantifier to some other meaning. And the way to see that is we could then go to that language that has some map, let's say, to snow, um, and we could just stipulatively reintroduce, stipulatively uh, introduce a new term, call it shmum, and shmum, let shmum have the semantic value of uh, non-empty, uh, of, of, of comparing properties and requiring a non-empty intersection. It has the semantic, the thin, merely formal semantic value of the real existential quantity. Now we've got this language in which uh, the syntactic string sum is mapped to God knows what, it doesn't matter. Uh, but it's also got this term shmum that's got a, an expression whose semantic value is that of requiring non-empty intersection over property sets. And we ask, what is the existential quantifier in this language? It's not sum, it's shmum. Uh, why? Well, by construction, shmum has exactly the semantic value of the existential quantifier. So changing the clause is not, is not relevant. I, one last thing, and this is important also to support the point that it's the domain that's really at issue. If you just change, semantic clauses are local to the particular expression at issue. So I can vary the semantic clauses. If I vary the semantic clause associated with some, I haven't varied the semantic clause associated with any other term in the language. So if I have a name, an, in the language, and a term, table in the language, for instance, uh, and uh, my interpretation function maps the extension of table to some non-empty set that includes and in it, then it's just going to fall out of my semantics 
that n is a table is true. But if I just change the clause associated with, uh, uh, with sum without changing anything with n or table, and if there was ever an opportunity to change that to some kind of nihilist quantifier meaning, then I, what, I, what we'd recover from that kind of causal variance is not the right, not the correct image of the nihilist as someone who doesn't believe in composite objects like tables, but a bizarre uh, system, a bizarre view on which it would be true to say that uh, uh, there do not exist any tables, given that we changed what sum or what exists, maybe I should have changed, what, given that we changed the clause associated with exists. Uh, but it would be also be true, given that we haven't touched the semantic value of an or the semantic value of table, it would also be true to say an is a table. So this kind of view would get to like, there don't exist any tables and an is a table. Okay. Uh, what we really want to recover a better image of the kind of nihilist that the quantifier variant is, is interested in is something much more holistic than just changing the local semantic value that a particular expression takes. We need to, when we move to a kind of nihilist language or to a universalist language or go back and forth, we need to make kind of holistic changes in names and predicates and the, uh, and, and the quantifier together. Uh, so um, we need something more holistic, and that's where domain variance, uh, I think, emerges as the right sort of thing for the quantifier variance to point at as the thing that varies. Okay. So, um, dom so um, domain variance is the idea that um, we don't change the, well, uh, so, so we've got this clause that maps exists or sum to non-empty intersection over property sets. Um, but we've also got this thing that um, I, I was mentioning briefly lives in the model that the interpreter uses in the meta language, this domain. Uh, and if we interpret the universalist to go back to the, remember the box I gave you at the beginning with the three dots in the box, we have our universalist and our nihilist talking about how, uh, how many things are in the box. If we interpret the universalist against a background domain that includes all the composites, then we get what she says coming up true when she says there are seven things are in the box. Because that will have, uh, if we just keep the, the clause, that will, the, the standard clauses, that will invoke uh, the semantic requirement that the intersection, she says, seven things are in the box, so things is the restrictor argument, and in the box, or box, let's say box dwellers, that's the scopal property. So what that requires is that the cardinality of uh, the intersection of the things and the box dwellers is seven. So if we model the universalist with a domain that's got all the composites, then it'll just be true that the cardinality of the intersection of the thing set and the box dweller set is seven. And we uh, model the nihilist via a domain that just has simples in it. Then the expressions, uh, seven things are in the box and three things are in the box, they'll have the exact same meanings in both the universalist and the nihilist language in the sense that they'll both express the requirements that seven things are in the box will express the requirement that the cardinality of the intersection of th the things set and the box dweller set is seven. Three things are in the box in both languages will express the requirement that the cardinality of the intersection of the things set and the box dweller set is three. So uh, they, they'll each use seven and three in the appropriate ways as the appropriate quantifiers there are, there, that they are. Uh, it'll just be true in the model that we're using for the universalist's language that, there are, that seven things are in the box. And it'll be true in the model that we're using for the nihilist language with its uh, uh, smaller domain that three things are in the box. So we get this idea of the universalist and nihilist each speaking truly in their respective languages, while actually really speaking, uh, I mean, they can homophonically translate each other 
We haven't changed the truth conditional requirements of any, uh, of any of their expressions. We've changed the background model against which those truth conditions, uh, we, against which we calculate whether those truth conditions are met or not. Um, we preserve the inferential role of the quantifiers, which recall was a core requirement uh, on making sure that they're both using quantifiers, just because, uh, well, we haven't changed the clause whatsoever. We're requiring that sum has the meaning of non empty intersection, that three has the meaning that the cardinality of the intersection is three, et cetera. Um, and uh, we got something finally, something that's holistic. Because the domain in, uh, in orthodox model theoretic semantics really is a kind of holistic master switch. Uh, names get their denotations off the domain. Uh, predicates get their interpretations from the domain. They are sets of uh, the entities in the domain that fall under the predicate. Quantifiers draw, range over the domain. They draw on the domain. So by having the domain be the thing that varies, we have these, we, so we have these two things that could vary, the clause and the domain. I've tried to argue that the clause can't do it. And here I'm arguing that the domain can do it. And the final respect in which I'm arguing the domain is the right thing to look at is it gets you this holistic result of coordinating names, predicates, and quantifiers. So recall that I was saying that if we just change the clause associated with sum to get to a kind of nihilist meaning of the quantifier, but didn't change the denotations of names or the extensions of predicates, we'd get the bizarre result of the nihilist saying um, uh, 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 there don't exist tables and an is a table. Uh, but here, because we change uh, the domain, an will get cut out of the domain. So that name will become an empty name. The predicate table uh, will all the things that, that initially fell under table in the universalist's uh, uh, model will also get cut out of the domain. So that will get the empty extension. So we won't get an as a table coming up. So, I'm on the last part now. So I've tried to convince you that there's, that this notion of quantifier meanings was too crude. And we should think of quantifier meanings as really having these, the clausal source and the domain source. And that the clauses associated with the quantifiers are these thin formal meanings that aren't really variable in interesting ways. But that what's variable in interesting ways, in a way that I think the quantifier variantist should seize upon, are the domains. And what I want to do in conclusion is just convince you that if you think the quantifier, that quantifier variants should be understood as domain variants in the way that I've been trying to convince you, then you should feel no pressure whatsoever towards adopting heavy ideology as the way to block quantifier variants. So the key observation here, which I've mentioned before, is, so, is that the domain is not an orthodox model theoretic semantics. It's not a term in the language at all. It's an object posited by the interpreter in the meta language to model the object language. Models are these domain interpretation pairs. So recall that heavy ideology was the idea I mean, that Sider was, was working with the idea that like, oh, we need the world to pick out certain expressions as the privileged ones to carve at the joints. Well, I'm saying if the threat was domain variance, that has absolutely nothing to do with the expressions in the object language under study, but rather has to do with the model that the interpreter uses to interpret the language. So the, head, the fan of heavy ontology, I think, uh, uh, what she should adopt to block the threat of domain variance is what I'll call domain realism. And that's the idea that there's a metaphysically distinguished domain. I'm not defending this. I'm saying this is what I, I happen to be a heavy ontologist. But I'm, for now, I'm just saying this is what the heavy ontologist should say as against the concern of domain variance. She should say that the world just offers up some pre-baked prefixed uh, 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 collection of objects. The world, as part of its fixed objective structure, just hosts certain objects. And that gives you a metaphysically distinguished domain. And what it is for, and moreover, here's, an inter here's, here's, 
the further claim. It's a constraint on adequate interpretation that the model uses the correct domain, the metaphysically uh, privileged domain. In particular, the interpreter who adopts a meta-language with a non-distinguished domain misinterprets the object language she studies. So, so this heavy ontologist will say, look, the world just, go, going back to the, the, the box with the three symbols in it, just focusing on that, pretend that's the whole world if you like. It says, look, the world just offers up some number of objects in the box. Maybe it's three, maybe it's seven, maybe it's something in between. We can have a real debate over that. Say, let's just say the world, in fact, offers up three. Then an adequate interpretation of a language must use that as its domain. Can't use seven. And that's going to mean that nihilists who say three things are in the box speak correctly. And universalists who say seven things are in the box, speak incorrectly. Because the only way to get them to speak correctly was to use the domain of seven things. And given our assumption that the nihilist was right about what the world, in fact, offers, uh, and the constraint that proper interpretation requires using this domain, that's going to mean that universalists speak falsely. No matter how often and fervently they insist, there are seven things in the box, seven things are in the box, no matter how charitable it would be to them in terms of preserving, maximizing the number of truths that they speak, they'd still be getting the world wrong. So, um, I should clarify what, dom so domain, the issue between domain realism and domain variance isn't an issue of which terms to adopt in the object language. The nihilist and the universalist can now be understood as just speaking exactly the same language. As I said, they can homophonically translate each other. They, they can each be speaking English. The language of ontology can just be English. It's really an issue not of which language to theorize in, but which interpretation we take of the language that we're theorizing in from the perspective of the meta language. And here there's just, I, I'm thinking, the debate over heavy ontology is just a debate over whether uh, uh, there is a metaphysical privilege for a particular domain or not. And that puts zero, because the domain isn't part of the object language at all, that puts zero pressure on your choice of terms in the, uh, in the object language. Speak any object language you like, compatible uh, uh, with certain constraints on expressive power, um, and um, There will be nothing in blocking the threat of quantifier variance when understood as domain variance will turn on whether it's English or, or Spanish or, or, or Russian or Chinese or ontologies. None of that matters. Um, and I should say that this conception of the domain as, uh, I mean, one of the things that ha in, in sort of contemporary model theory, you know, we're, we interpret semantically by using these mathematical widgets of uh, 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 domains and interpretations. Um, but there's this older pre-model theoretic conception that goes back to Frege, where, as, which, uh, where as, as Dummett points out, um, the domain, uh, we don't think, it, we, we don't yet have this idea of a model. The domain is just assumed to be um, the totality of all objects. Um, and what I'm really saying is that the mathematical widgets of model theory don't change that essentially insightful Phrygian observation. We have this mathematical widget and we can play around with it, but there's still the question of whenever we're indulging in any sort of modeling or representation, what counts as an apt model or an apt representation of the target? And what I'm saying is when we're using the, uh, uh, the mathematical representation of model theoretic semantics, uh, the heavy ontologist should say that there is a worldly constraint on which is the right model to adopt, namely that the world constrains us to adopt the domain that is, just as Frege puts it, the totality of all objects. And so if I'm right, then we can have a uh, heavy ontology, we can believe that there is a, uh, the world gives us uh, some totality of objects. 
without putting any constraints on ideology whatsoever. So we don't need to care whether it's conjunction and negation or disjunction and negation. Uh, we can be uh, pragmatists about, the, uh, about how we theorize about the world while still thinking that the world comes with an inbuilt collection of objects. Thank you.